And then, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Alan Seppenwall. Hey there, welcome to the OC panel. I won't say the last line of Luke's dialogue, but we have a, a bunch of core members of the creative team, starting with the show's creator and executive producer, Josh Schwartz. Uh, executive producer, executive producer, sorry, Stephanie Savage. Yeah. Writer and producer, Lila Gerstein. Yeah. And the woman who picked so many of those memorable songs is music supervisor, Alexander Patsavis. Yeah. Pause for awkward silence. All right. Josh, you were like 17 years old when you created the show, right? <laughs> roughly, roughly. Like, what was the impetus? Where did the idea come from? Uh, the impetus came from, I was from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> All right, yeah, somebody. Uh, and I came out to uh, California to USC for <laughs> college. All right, <laughs> Trojans. And uh, that is where I first met the species known as water polo player. <laughs> and uh, saw all of these uh, women falling in love with these guys who just were like extremely chlorinated with their hair all messed up and they wore Speedos. I didn't get the attraction, but uh, they did. And, uh, and that was sort of my first exposure to uh, the Orange County lifestyle. Um, so ordinarily, you know, you've always maintained that you've never seen an episode of 90210. I'm still I, skeptical. But. I mean, maybe like one here or there. Stephanie, right. Stephanie is the aficionado. All right. So, but the, the model of soaps at the time is sort of they were, you know, teen soaps were driven by the female characters, and you've got a show built around the two sort of uh, unofficial brothers and Sandy, the, the dad. Uh, how did that come about? Well, that was just uh, kind of what I wanted to write about at the time, I guess, about you know uh, brothers and fathers and sons, and we talked about it that it was unusual to do a show like that that was a, a nighttime uh, soap for a network, but uh, luckily back then I didn't know better, and uh, and Stephanie, as my producer, was very encouraging of that, and uh, and 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 you know that was kind of my way into doing uh, a nighttime soap. Definitely having sort of a neurotic Jewish guy who could kind of comment on it while it was happening made me feel much more comfortable writing it. Uh, well, I didn't hear a shout out for all the neurotic Jews in the audience. By <laughs> the way. All right, there we go. All right. Um, how comfortable was Fox with the neurotic Jew of it all, exactly? Um, I would say medium comfortable. <laughs> uh, it definitely, uh, part of obviously that was Seth Combs, sort of Josh's way into the show, and it was also what made the show in many ways unique. Um, that this character was there that had the pers perspective that he had. But because it was unique, I think it was challenging for the network who wasn't used to seeing a character like that in their glossy nighttime soap. And so there were a couple conversations about how nerdy should uh, Seth be. The Coens were originally uh, named the Needlemans. <laughs> <laughs> they got a little less Jewish. <laughs> but uh, luckily, you know, then you find somebody like Adam Brody who walks in and just makes it all work. And, uh, and the ladies uh, like, and I think everybody felt comfortable. <laughs> everybody felt comfortable that this could be a romantic uh, lead for the show equal to, to Ryan. But, but Josh did get the question that um, if uh, Ben was the Dylan, then who was the uh, Brandon? And he did not understand what that meant. <laughs> Um, Summer is only like a guest star on the pilot, she's got a couple of lines, so Marissa is the major young female character. Stephanie, what do you remember in your early talks with Josh about the development of that character? Well, what I remember most is a line that you'll hear um, a little later in the script um, that I loved when Josh, uh, when I read it, when he wrote it, that um, Marissa was, you know, so beautiful she was a little embarrassed by it, um, which I loved, sort of that That was evoked. also based on my personal experience. <laughs> It evoked so much about this girl um, and just sort of the awkwardness of uh, being a great beauty at that age and, and not kind of trying to figure out who you were. And then the next thought I had was like, how are we going to cast that? Because <laughs> that's a pretty tall order. Yeah, and Olivia Wilde, who wound up being on the show in the second season, she read for Marissa. Yeah, it came down to Misha and Olivia for it. Um, and they were both, well, Misha had actually been a child actor. She'd been in The Sixth Sense and other things. Olivia was brand new. Uh, but Marissa was obviously a character who, who Ryan needed to save, you know, uh, in some respects. And uh, Olivia Wilde needs no saving. 
<laughs> so uh, she's pretty tough. All right, so you had, you'd never even been on staff on a TV show before. All of a sudden, you're, you're mid-20s, giving your own show, and you've got these seven episodes that you've got to do coming on right in the summer. How crazy was that time? It was pretty crazy. I think the craziest part was because they wanted the show on in the summer. We, we literally went right from the pilot uh, directly into the start of the series. So while we were making the pilot, we were also editing a kind of like 15 minute, roughly teaser reel of the first two weeks of shooting because we needed the show to get ordered before we even wrapped uh, the pilot. So that was pretty crazy and we kind of knew what the, and we had a writing staff already going. Uh, and again, I was very lucky to have Stephanie uh, with me, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. And uh, we kind of knew it was all building to Tijuana. And then after that, we were pretty confident we were going to get canceled. <laughs> so when Fox, when you start seeing the numbers and the show is a success and you're going to have to keep making it, was that a, a happy realization? Oh yeah, of course, of course. You can. Yeah, it was interesting too because it aired in the summer. Um, and again, this is a whole like we're going to talk about some of the stuff regarding the show, like it happened in the 1800s, but like. <laughs> There was no iTunes, there was no Netflix, there was no Hulu, there was no way of seeing, you know. But so in the, in the summer, they were able to run this show like three times a week. Uh, and so the first week it premiered and we were like, okay, everyone thought it was gonna do better, but uh, we'll hang in there. And then the following week it went up and then the following week and it kind of built through that whole summer run. And so we were very fortunate that we got that kind of uh, pattern of episodes to run. Now before we move a little deeper into, into that first season, uh, I gotta ask about Luke's iconic line from the pilot, welcome to the OC, bitch. Where did that come from? Uh, when I was at SC, there were, there were all these guys that were as, uh, you know, like these water polo player guys who would refer to Orange County as the OC. Because when the show first premiered, a lot of people were like, nobody calls it the OC, don't call it the OC. It's just OC, which, you know, doesn't roll off the tongue. And I did hear people talk about the, the OC as if they were referring to the LBC. You know, they were trying to make it sound uh, cooler than it was. So it was always a little bit of an ironic uh, title for us. And, uh, and then at some point it was like, you know, we got to work that into the show. And who better <laughs> to deliver that line than Luke? Um, you're obviously a big music fan. For the first, those first seven episodes, you were picking all the music by yourself. How exciting was it to be able to sort of put some of your favorite bands and artists on TV in that way? Uh, that was super fun. I mean, yeah, Steph and I would run out of editing and go to like Amoeba Records and buy a bunch of music. Cause, uh, and at a certain point, uh, and again, we talked at the beginning because there was a real music scene in Orange County at that time that was more of this sort of sublime, no doubt kind of uh, music, um, which was great, but, but we really wanted music to kind of illuminate the interior lives of the characters and kind of be a character in the show itself. So um, it was a great opportunity to put, put music on that we were listening to at the time. And luckily, again, because it was the you know, 1800s when we made the show, there was only uh, radio, which was extremely consolidated at that time. Uh, MTV, TRL would play like the same 10 videos. And so there was all of this music that just no one could hear. And as soon as we started putting the music on the show, uh, we found that there was a, a whole audience of people who either also loved that music or we're discovering that music with the show. And that became a really exciting component. And then by episode seven, uh, I'd used up all the music on my iPod, and that brought in the great Alex Pitsavis. All right, so let, let's talk about that, Alex. When, <laughs> were you even aware of the show before you got a call about coming on it? <laughs> Microphone. We were all aware of the show, of course. So what, what did you think of Josh's taste in music? I thought, um, from, from afar. It was, it, I thought it was awesome. You know, like it was, I had many friends that were working on the show as well, um, but I, I didn't think there was a chance for me to work on the show, so I was watching as a fan. So when you finally got together, sort of what, con what were the conversations like in terms of what kind of music Josh wanted, what kind of things you thought you could bring to the show that he hadn't already? I think you had already defined the kind of music that you wanted, I just needed to find more of it. Right? I mean, yeah, no, and Alex is fine. I mean, a lot of stuff that we were putting in the show was stuff that had been out for a little while because we had obviously bought it and, uh, and we're now using it. And Alex was able to kind of uh, expose to us all this stuff that was definitely in the, the lane of what we wanted to do but hadn't come out yet and, uh, and get stuff even earlier. And eventually, like, you know, the show blew up to the point where, like, labels were asking you to premiere songs on the show. Yeah, the day we got the call saying the Beastie Boys wanted to premiere their new song on the show, we're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I remember going to uh, Capitol Records yeah. to hear a, uh, a little known Coldplay song called Fix You. They played us the album. Um, we sat right. in the room, they played us the album, they said, pick the song that you want to have on the show. Right. And we're like, okay, we could do that. <laughs> and, uh, and we heard Fix You and we're like, That's, that right. will work. We don't know what the scene is yet, but that will work. 
No, we had lots of special opportunities on, on the OC. We did six soundtracks in four seasons. Um, we had the bait shop, which of course we had a lot of, uh, of live, live bands playing. Um, <laughs> The Death Cab and The Killers and Modest Mouse, um, and then a series of covers, which were, we started, our first one I believe was Jem doing Maybe I'm Amazed, um, which uh, was a, you know, which was interesting to clear because of the gender switch, um, yeah. as well as a little known artist, you know, little known writer named Paul McCartney, who we had to clear it from. Uh, and then if we you leave also, if, if you, you leave, leave, yeah. yeah. So, it you know, so many, um, so many opportunities for music and then so much excitement amongst the music business to be a part of the show. I assume there was a lot of like pressure from bands like who really, really wanted to be on the show. Were there ever any like artists or songs you chased and you couldn't get? They didn't want to be affiliated in one way Why or Why do we need to focus on the negative, Alan? <laughs> Arcade Fire. Tell me more. I, that's all I'm gonna say, that's all I'm but gonna say. But honestly, that was, I mean, it's a pretty small list. Like we were really lucky. Um, Rooney, where did the, <laughs> it's, it's one of the most memorable episodes of the show. They go to see the, they go to see Rooney play. Luke asks, which one is Rooney? Um, where, where did the idea and how did you land on them as the band that they would go see for that episode? Well, I think, I think we talked about bands at that moment who felt like they were in the, in the, you know, zone, uh, who would, who would appear on camera. And also there was a connection with, uh, Phantom Planet, right? You want yes. to talk about that? Do you remember that connection? Yeah, they were okay. brothers. Yeah, they were brothers. Yeah, so, um, no, they were, they were um, somewhat in the family yeah. and, and fans and uh, in Los Angeles. And you have to think, um, in order to get up, TV time and band time don't really have a lot in common. Um, so we had some, you know, 7 a.m. pickups for a band to, like, to be on camera all day. So there's a lot of scheduling. Um, and typically the kinds of bands that we were interested in are the kinds of bands that toured colleges and small venues and a lot of that stuff happens in the fall after the summer festival circuit. And so we were always sort of hoping to get people on their way through town in LA. So we, you know, we just worked at it. Um, Chris Mika, another <laughs> memorable invention of the OC. Is that, is that a holiday you and your family had celebrated? It's not a holiday uh, that, that we celebrated. It was something we talked about in the room. Stephanie wrote that episode. It was her first episode writing on the show. <laughs> And, and, uh, but it felt like it really, you know, spoke to what we were trying to do with the show. It, it, you know, we were, we had, we had a lot of, uh, you know, Judaism on the show. We had a Passover Seder on the show. Yeah. But obviously the idea was Sandy had married kind of the ultimate Shiksa goddess. And what would, <laughs> and what, what child would that, would come out of it? It would be somebody who would uh, realize a way of getting even more presents <laughs> than, uh, than a single religion. S Stephanie, when you were writing that episode, sort of how did you figure out what exactly the rules and traditions of Chris Mika were? Well, the episode was the sort of the theme of it was about, you know, blending or integration that was Ryan was someone who'd had a pretty negative track record with Christmases. And so he didn't have po positive feelings about the holidays. And Seth was caught in a love triangle between Anna and Summer. In a Wonder Woman costume. <laughs> <laughs> and so that idea of um, trying to make the best of things and kind of cherry pick, um, seeing how far Seth could take that, which uh, Chris Mika was a positive example where it worked and Summer and Anna was a little bit more complicated than that. I, it was an opportunity. I, I did own that sweater that Seth wears in that episode. <laughs> that's I very nice. could finally do something positive with it. Well, speaking of Anna, like that's, that's a character arc that on a sort of more traditionally paced show, you would have taken like a year and a half to work through all the Anna stuff and some air kind of came in and out very quickly. You went through a lot of plot over those, the first season. Yes. Um, in hindsight, would you have done anything differently or not because oh, that sure. first season was so good? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, wisdom is great and knowledge is power, but ignorance is bliss. And uh, I don't know what that means, but you all figure it out later. But, um, you know, part of it is we didn't really know the rules, and so we were kind of making it up as we were going along, and I think part of the fun of that first season was how much story we were going through. Um, and then season two started, we're like, wow, we went through a lot of story last season. <laughs> and I think, I think, you know, you obviously you learn as you go, and it was lessons that we took with us on, on shows afterwards were if you have characters that people really love on your show and are, are connected with, you should try to keep them around. And, uh, and there, was, there was a lot of Luke stories, I think, we left on the table, Anna stories, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you had to sort of basically start the show over from scratch in a lot of ways in season two. You introduced a bunch of new characters, including the one played by Olivia Wilde. Um, you know, having now done it for a year, what were the challenges going into that second one for you guys? 
I think, I think uh, to that point, introducing a bunch of new characters and trying to keep the show. We, we were trying to avoid um, something that had been done for a while and obviously done for good reason, which is just take your kind of core couples and just re-couple them. Um, meaning, you know, Seth would be with Marissa and Ryan would be with Summer. We kind of felt like that was verboten. And so uh, we wanted to try to introduce some new characters and see, and see what clicked. Um, Lila, you came on in the third season, which is when we first met Taylor Townsend, who is sort of the one... Yeah, everybody loves Taylor. Taylor is the one late addition to the, the young cast that people really took to. What are, what are your memories of her introduction, and at what point did you realize sort of that she's not a villain, like she's going to be awesome? Um, well, the writers loved writing Taylor Townsend. We loved talking about her. She was so annoying and so <laughs> delicious, and her dialogue was so fun, and she was smart, and she was wily, and she was... Um, and so I think we, as a group, fell in love with her, and we're like, we have to <laughs> keep her around. Um, and, you know, sometimes in season three of a show, like, the writers, we needed, we needed a new voice, and we needed... Um, she, she really excited us. Season three also reintroduced a character we hadn't seen in a long time in Caitlin, who was once Shailene Woodley, and I don't know what happened to her. And she became... <laughs> Where is Shailene? And she became Willa Holly. Uh, does Shailene, like, ever send you bitter letters or anything? I think Shailene's doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, young so Shailene did send us a really sweet letter when she drew a picture of... China, uh, her, China pony. her pony. Yeah, yeah. Her <laughs> alopecia-ridden <laughs> pony that China had. Um, but... What were, what were you guys hoping to do when you brought Caitlin back in in the form of Willa Holland? I'll give that to Lila because she actually wrote the introduction, uh, the reintroduction of Caitlin Cooper with an incredible monologue that uh, <laughs> made everybody laugh. Um, I think Caitlin came on. She was the new villain, but she had I, she had a dark past, and we she had a good nickname, Mini Coop. Mini Coop. <laughs> she had a great nickname, and. Um, I, I, she came back on, she seemed innocent. We had only seen her as a little girl and she came back and she was a grown woman. She had like, I think she had like a drug dealer boyfriend. <laughs> she was really, um, but she was, uh, you know, she came in, we needed an engine to wreak havoc on our characters who were, they were- Can't let Julie pieces. Cooper, you know, yeah. have her moment of peace for too long. Well, well let's talk about Julie and about the adult. Yeah, she yeah. Ate you. <laughs> It's true. It was Let, a nice trailer park. Let's talk about Julie and the adults on the show, because that was another thing that really made the OC stand out, was there were great kid characters, but like Sandy and Kirsten and Julie were also really... And Jimmy. And Jimmy, yes, were also really interesting characters who you told a lot of good stories with. What were the challenges in sort of trying to keep their stories in play while also being in Kid World a lot of the time? Yeah, I mean, the first part we cast in the show was, was Peter Gallagher, you know, as Sandy Cohen, and we really wanted to... Yes. Um... And, you know, he was a great actor who had been in, in Soderbergh movies and Coen Brothers movies. And we really wanted to kind of send the message that this was uh, a show that could be for adults as much as kids and that we were going to be as invested in those stories. And we always talked about the idea that you could pull the kids out of the show and do the story of, like, you know, Kirsten and Jimmy living next door to each other and Sandy, kind of the, those high school sweethearts finding each other again late in life. So we wanted to make sure those stories were potentially as interesting without the kids. And then as the kids get older, obviously, it, it becomes challenging to keep them as involved in their kid lives as parents because the kids now are becoming sort of, you know, uh, grown up in their, in their own right. Um, at the end of season three, you did something that's easily the most divisive thing that happened on the show. You killed Marissa. Some people were very upset. Some people celebrated, you know, <laughs> because we're monsters. Talk about your decision. Why did you decide it was time for Marissa to go? Oh, okay. <laughs> It's complicated. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of factors involved, and it was something we really wrestled with, and, and, uh, and, and uh, there was reasons both creative and also um, in terms of the, just for the show itself, in, in terms of where we were at that moment with the network, and, and there was a lot of reasons both creative and cynical, I guess I, you could say. Um, and, uh, and it's something we still wrestle with. I mean, Steph and I, you know, we still talk about it and, and, and play it back. And, and I think, you know, to your point, there were some people who celebrated, and at that time, those were the most vocal people. Those were the people that had control of like whatever the pre-Twitter, you know, TV without pity forums were back then. Um, and and what we found was, and this is this was a really good lesson for us moving forward in in the rest of our TV lives, is that if somebody, uh, you know, 
post something online, uh, and Steph always talks about this, it's, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that person uh, isn't necessarily speaking for a thousand people, they're just speaking for themselves. But it feels like they're speaking for a thousand people because they are speaking the most vocally. And then after we did that, we realized there was a lot of people who hadn't been speaking who actually were quite upset and very attached to that character. And there was a lot of uh, anger and fan art that came our way afterwards. <laughs> Uh, but it did sort of, m moving beyond a lot of the, the melodrama that Marissa had been going through, allowed you to go for a much lighter tone for that fourth and final season. Um, did, did you feel like you had sort of lost the comedy a little bit in the middle years? Yeah, I think, I mean, Taylor and Caitlin, as we've referenced, were certainly comedic characters, but I think we were all feeling like we wanted to get back to the humor that had been such a big part of the show uh, in the first couple of seasons. And uh, what better way to do that than bring on Chris Pratt? Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt uh, playing a didgeridoo, I think. So. Well, it was Che fun to write for. Oh, Che was incredible to write for. That, that was season four was a really fun season for us. And did you know like the whole time that this was going to be it, or at what point did you realize? Yeah, I think we. I think going into it, we had a we had a pretty good sense that that was going to be the final season, and so it was very freeing creatively. And we did some really weird stuff in season <laughs> four, like Che falls in love with Seth's spirit animal, you know, stuff that we would never have uh, would what, never have been able to try. Did Taylor wear a groundhog costume at one point? Yeah, there may have been that. There was like a French talk show. <laughs> Japons. Japons. Yes, exactly. So uh, you know, it definitely we took some chances that I think we probably would have felt uncomfortable uh, doing before that. Like, I mean, do you feel like if, if the ratings had been going differently, there was life in the show that you could have done a fifth season? Yeah, I mean, I would say after season four, we were feeling like, oh, we sort of get what this more adult version of the show is. It's tricky to getting kids out of, like when you transition a teen show out of high school, there's a reason that on 90210, they spent four years in high school and then they went to college and it was exactly like high school. Like, there was a reason they did that. We didn't want to do that, but what we tried to do was um, had some challenges in it. And I think once we were in season four, we were like, we can just kind of do this forever. All right, we're going to go to audience questions in just a second, but first I just wanted to kind of go down the line. I'm curious, we were talking about music before. Does each of you have, it, maybe not the favorite, but a favorite musical moment from the show? Uh, sure. Alex, you want to go take this one first? It's really hard for me. It's very hard for me to, to pick one. I spend so much time with so many of them. Um, but I think... My favorite sync use, which is which is an existing piece of music, was be dice during the New Year's um, episode. I love that, um, and I loved all our bait shop appearances. I mean, they were they was they were fun to put together. There's lots of gossip about them all that I you know that's not appropriate for here, but super fun. Um, for me, I guess it's the most obvious, but season one, Hallelujah. Um, an uplifting one when when uh, Seth and Summer kiss for the first time on the coffee card. I love that moment in the Patrick Park song that plays. Yeah, I would say uh, Matt Pond's cover of Champagne Supernova for the Spider-Man kiss is definitely, and uh, and the and the most indelible one also for me is uh, Joseph Arthur's Honey in the Moon because that was. Um, and and the Imogen Heap song Hide and Seek oh, yeah, has had like yeah, this yeah, huge well, life after the yes, fact. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so um, I don't know what the situation is with microphones, but if people have questions, raise your hands and we'll figure it out. We got someone right over there. Shout Just skip, yeah, shout it out. So my, my question is actually about Anna. Um, did you did you have to get rid of her because she was like clearly like the more healthy choice for that? <laughs> Isn't that what we all do in life? <laughs> uh, I think we felt like we had played through that triangle and therefore uh, it was time for Anna to go. Seth had sort of made his, his choice. Um, and it was time for Seth and Summer to get together. But in retrospect, I, I think we still talk about the possibilities of an Anna-Luke uh, relationship <laughs> that could have run, run for many years. All right, uh, do we have other questions for the mic over here? People can, there we go. Um, in the final kind of montage of the series, you see what happens with all of their lives and kind of the next years, and it ends with Ryan. How did you guys settle on what happens with them? Were there other things you considered putting in there? And thanks for being here. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we had big discussions. It was very exciting to kind of be able to 
see our characters grow up and see the future and um, we, we spent quite a long time discussing and I think this is what we all agreed was the right thing. And, and we like bringing it full circle where Ryan circle. got to see a yeah. kid that he could you know, potentially extend the same uh, favor to that, that Sandy did to him. Next up. Um, I have a question about the It's a Wonderful Life episode. <laughs> Just the um, kind of the creative process behind that, the decision to do that, you know, how that came about. Well, we had done usually something special for the holidays. We did a Chris McKay episode for every season. Um, and in our final season, we were talking about just sort of what was a shape that we can, um, you know, sort of lock into. And I think, I think, John and JJ thought it was pretty stupid <laughs> at the beginning. They're not here to defend themselves, so we can talk freely about them. Um, but then I think I kind of like dug my heels in and was like, you can do whatever you want with this, but it somehow has to relate to It's a Wonderful Life. Um, and they came up with something that was, I thought, just completely amazing. And it allowed us to, to sort of what, what would have happened if Ryan didn't show up in the OC, um, but it allowed us to bring back uh, cast members and come up with these crazy scenarios of who would have ended up with who and um, just how broken that world would be. And then also to tell kind of a serious, uh, more kind of healing story um, about the death of Marissa. So um, I personally, that's one of my favorite episodes. Hi, first off, uh, First off, I just want to say that the show basically shaped me who I am. I watched this in middle school, and I'm continuously recommending it to my friends today to make the mid-2000s live on forever because <laughs> the best music was then, in my personal opinion. mid arts. Yes. <laughs> but um, my question is, so you mentioned uh, Morgan Heap's high and, high and Seek, that iconic scene at the end. Did you think that it would become that iconic scene that was played on into the SNL skit and everything. Totally. We wrote that and we're like, wait eight years, and then Lowly <laughs> Island's going to do a commercial video of this. Uh, no, I mean, that was, again, Alex would make us these comps, and at the beginning of the year, uh, got the comp and heard that song and said, can you please reach out to Imogen Heap and just make sure they don't license this song to anybody, because we're going to use it in the finale. Don't know what that is yet, but it's going to, it just feels like it's so, like, part of the, the show. And then the way Ann Toynton directed that episode and Norman Buckley cut that uh, episode and used the music and brought it, you know, used it initially for Caleb's funeral and then obviously brought it back for the end. It just really uh, made it something that, uh, you know, we're really proud of that it, it endures, even in parody. It's the highest compliment. <laughs> Love watching that video, still do it all the time. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Hello, thank you guys for coming back and uh, allowing us to relive our greatest high school moments. Um, <laughs> I just had a question. I'm from LA and I just love the show within the show of the valley and I think Alan you talked about that in Ask Alan but um, when you guys went to in the LA episode did you guys ever think about doing a spin-off with the valley and having Colin Hanks you know be the, be the star yeah we we got really into the valley yeah. we had, at, at that point in the show we had basically deconstructed our own show and uh, and had it live on in, in parody um, but that was probably as far as we should have taken it. So wait, that wait, was good. With Paris, Paris Hilton discussing, you know, Thomas Pynchon and the use of magical realism, which she initially called magnetic reality, uh, which we, we corrected her. Uh, that was that was pretty fun. Did, did you have like a series Bible for the Valley? Like how deep did it go? Oh, it went deep. Fourteen seasons of the, of the Valley. At least. Yeah. And then it also had spinoffs. What was the one that had like the real skanks of oh, yeah. the Valley? Yeah. Yeah, because we were also living through Laguna Beach, the real OC happening while we were doing our show. And the real housewives. And the real housewives of Orange County. So then naturally it's, the it's, valley. It's all your fault, Josh. It really. is all our fault. <laughs> if only we could have gotten one nickel from those real housewives. <laughs> if only our agent was in here somewhere and failed to secure that deal. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the idea of yeah, the real skanks of, of, the, of the valley would have been a really good show. All right, thank you guys. Um, I mean, a after this, you guys, the two of you went on to do Gossip Girl, but there's not... Yeah. At, least, at least on network, there's not really a good teen soap right now. What, what's going on? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 we, we feel you, because we would want to watch it or, or make it. But uh, I think right now we're in a period where I don't know that the next great teen drama is going to be on a network. It's going to be on network. I think you're going to find it somewhere else, um, and that's just fine. Something else that starts with an N that's not network? <laughs> Anybody? No? Um, hello. Thank you for being here. Um, I, <laughs> and people might disagree with me, I kind of love Oliver. 
Um, <laughs> An Oliver head, all right. He, Rare breed. He's the best, worst thing ever, and he stresses me out so much. <laughs> so, and I just want to hit Marissa, but, and, you know, she comes to her senses. Anyway, um, I wanted to know, how did that come up? Who was like, Let's have this insane person just wreck everybody's life. I want to know that. Well, you know, when you're doing 27 episodes, <laughs> you need some new story material. But I believe Oliver made his debut in the Christmas episode. Stephanie, would you like to talk about Oliver? Why, yes, he did. Um, uh, after the departure of uh, Anna and Luke, um, we realized that uh, we didn't have enough <laughs> yeah, characters on the show. Um, and in a similar way that... Uh, Luke and Anna were still around. We think we knew they were okay. leaving. Yeah. Okay, we knew they were yeah, leaving. Sorry, fact yeah, check. Right. Fact sorry, check. fact check. It's been a while, guys. Um, that uh, we just wanted somebody to come on the show that would, you know, uh, wreak some havoc, cause some problems, force our group to kind of test their bonds and, uh, you know, see how strong they were and, and stress some viewers out. <laughs> you were stressed out. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more audience question if someone has one. Otherwise, I can ask something, but... Right, uh, right down there. Who came up with the yarn clubs? <laughs> yeah, the award that they deserve. I will say that I believe I came up with the Yama Claws, but I completely failed to trademark it in any <laughs> way that could be monetized moving oh, forward. Should I should have that my family still celebrates Christmas. I agree. If only, again, my agent were in this room <laughs> and could have helped me in some way see the, the value of that. What are Seth and Summer up to today? What do you guys think Seth and Summer are up to today? I mean, I think that's the more interesting thing when shows end, right? Is letting, you want to give audiences some closure, but you don't want to give them complete closure, I think, and let them sort of live on in, in people's imaginations. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, the creative team of the OC.